Hello and welcome to Linux Lads, episode 105. Um, this week, it's just me and Mike. Say hello, Mike. Hello, hello. So yeah, uh, the other two are off. Uh, Amalith is actually at Self, uh, Southeast Linux Fest in the US. And Connor is in the UK, I believe. Um, he's at Download Festival, the lucky bugger. So uh, I once again forgot to book a ticket to download. So here I am. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I just don't think that the gods want me to go to any rock festivals ever. So this week, it's just me and Mike. So we're going to have a talk about what's what sort of pursuits do we have outside of all of this Linux uh, stuff? Like, what, so what's the common denominator amongst all of us nerds? Uh, what, 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 what other sort of pursuits do we have and where, where does it kind of overlap with Linux, I guess? So it's kind of a non-Linux episode, I suppose. I think straight off the bat, looking at uh, Mike's uh, camera feed here, because we do a video call while we record, um, he has quite a lot of board games in the background, and so do I. Um, so I think that's a good place to start off. So I think both of us are huge board game nerds, which is probably nothing unusual in the Linux sphere. Yeah, I'm not sure. I wouldn't call myself huge just because I don't have... It's really hard to find the time for uh, for any pursuits. But like, yeah, we did spend today most of the day just playing um, with, uh, with Elisa, with uh, Twilight Struggle, which is the one uh, that you can play. You can see, well... The listeners can't see it, but basically, yeah, we we do put a lot of time into board games. Uh, like neither of us plays too much video games. I think Elisa plays, you know, the kind of mobile games on her phone. I don't do that much, but uh, board games, yeah, definitely, it's a great pastime. Uh, they kind of, uh, yeah, I don't know how to describe it. There's, it's not that I like the physicality of it too much. It can actually get really annoying when you have. You have to make sure that you don't move the desk or anything too much so that you don't move the pieces around. But there is something to it, um, to the whole, yeah, to the whole physicality. You have a map and you have uh, have pieces and it comes with a story. And I think that's the biggest thing about it is the story that it comes with. I agree. I think it's more intentional. Like a, a board or a video game, you can just switch it on and start playing and it's very easy. Um, but with a board game, there's a whole ritual that goes around it for me because uh, I'm the same. I think we're very similar. I don't actually play a ton of games myself. And I, when I do play games, they tend to actually be similar, more similar to board games than most video games. Uh, I tend to play like, you know, expansive strategy games with lots of very dense rules and things like that. Um, so I'm kind of looking for immersion more so than playing a game. You know, I'm looking to kind of play a role, if you will. Um, and uh, you know, manage something, create something, uh, and I think you can do that with board games a lot more. And it's yeah, like I said, it's the whole ritual. It's like you invite your friends over, you spend like ten, fifteen minutes setting it up, and you get some snacks, you get some, you get some drinks and stuff, and you can just like sit around and talk. And you know, it's just a lot nicer, I think, than playing a video game. I mean, I don't play multiplayer games. I just hate, I hate anything PvP. I hate. Com- competition in games you know i just i just don't like that aspect of it mainly because you know i'm an adult with a job and everything so i don't have time to <laughs> perfect my skills in these games so i just get murdered in the first 10 seconds of every round if it's a competitive game um so i tried to play rocket league before i find the game rocket league quite fun but i could not play that online because the first like i would just have like a bunch of like snot nosed teenagers like calling me names in the chat because I was so shit and <laughs> just wasn't a good experience. But yeah, the whole ritual of it is what I like, you know. I like, um, so for us, it's definitely the same, right? It's the time spent together because we, if we were, we, we, we are not into the same video games, even if we were playing them. And as same as you, I wouldn't spend time online getting blasted to smithereens by teenagers in any amount, you know. I wouldn't play CSGO online because I just, it just wouldn't make any sense. I tried uh, uh, Team Fortress, you know, or one of those things that normally lands on Linux. I tried to play it online, and I'm just terrible. Uh, terrible. It's, it's not a great experience for myself, and it's not a great experience to have me on the team because you end up with uh, it, it, because I'm not uh, I'm not too great at it. So uh, on the other hand, with board games, you unless it's some kind of a speed gaming setting or something, you always know the people you play with. Mm. So at least to some degree, right? So 
So it is a it is not uh, going online and killing strangers or pixel representative representations of strangers. It's uh, it's sharing an experience with somebody you know, which is a good thing. So it's a social thing, but not like social network, mm. but like the old school social thing, right? Yeah. And old fashioned social media where you just go to someone's house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, we are both not exactly very competitive, uh, or we are maybe too competitive to be able to play this competitively. At least, you know, we have to, you, you don't want to overdo it. So when we play, like we have, I don't know if you can see it, but we have about uh, three different versions of Ticket to Ride, and uh, that we play somewhat weirdly where we try to not compete with each other stay out of each other's way as much as possible i think we even amended the rules a little so that we we kind of take it to ride for those who don't know is a it's a game where you basically create um mostly train but also uh boat infrastructure to you basically make a lines traffic lines uh, between or transportation lines from one city to another. You draw a card and it tells you, uh, connect these two places on a map, and you just do that. Obviously, there's more to it, to it but that's basically the, the, the gist of the game. There is a phone version, but don't play that, it's awful. <laughs> and, and yeah, we manage, because it's for more than two people. Well, it can be played by two people, but it can be played by up to six. So we managed to kind of play to stay out of each other's hair, which is an interesting experience as well. I I have a younger sister, and we played a few board games when we were little, obviously, and that was a completely different uh, experience where we were, we would do anything for the for the other one to win. So so it's no sorry for for yourself to win. Sorry, but it's, I'm a bit too tired. I spell I spent uh, five hours trying to. Uh, make sure that the free world uh, will uh, once again uh, <laughs> triumph over the evil empire in in the board game, and it, and we did win. But uh, well, that's uh, yeah, echo- it took it out of me. Echoes of real life, there, I guess. <laughs> now that we're <laughs> for the dystopian so, future, uh, we're headed for. <laughs> well, so Twilight Struggle is um, is a game where you play the Cold War, basically from mid forties to late nineties. We only just bought it like two weeks ago or a week ago, so we have never finished it, actually. Because even for gifted and experienced players, it takes about three hours. And for us, obviously, we we got as f- the furthest today, and we I think we managed to go like mid, mid-war, so it would be somewhere... We, we, we are past the Kennedy administration into Nixon's administration, I think, right? But, uh, so it's a basically a game where one of you play for the Soviets and the other one plays for the, for the free world or the Americans. And it's a game of influence, so it's a bit like Risk, but without the armies. You can you control a territory, but you you control it by influence points. There is there is a no- notion of control and influence rather than of divisions and uh, hmm. kind of. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I don't want to go too technical into it. And it's a card driven game, uh, which is which is f- f- so fun about it. There's a lot of history to it, and that that's really that's really nice because you get to. The stories that come with it, like like a Joker card, like a you know wild card called the China card, so you can play the China card, <laughs> and that means that you get to that to, you know why is it called the China card? Well, it gives you an advantage when you, you you kind of swap them, and it gives the player who holds it an advantage uh, because China had that kind of decided position uh, in the Cold War when when they used to obviously be more or less aligned with the Soviet Union at the start, but then. Uh, you know, things were kind of really complicated. So uh, anyway, so that's that's the kind of um, thing that we occupy ourselves. Mm. What um, what games are you playing on the on the board? Um, well, lately, not not too many, just through uh, circumstance, I guess. But uh, usually, uh, I, w- I went through a, f- a phase years ago of playing Catan- Settlers of Catan religiously with my friends. And it got to a point where it almost wasn't enjoyable anymore because we we all knew each other quite well. We were all like kind of old friends. So we would just like get in each other's heads for the entire game. And like we'd actually like start bickering and fighting over rules and everything. And it just got to a point where it was no longer enjoyable. And we were all quite good at Catan. So it was incredibly competitive. And when you won, it felt like it was the best rush ever when you won because we were all so deep into this game and we knew all the strategies and all the ways of getting 
getting your wheat and getting your bricks and all that kind of thing. I'm sure quite a lot of people listening to this podcast have most likely heard of Catan. Um, it's a very, very well-known game. A lot of people consider it to be the best board game there is. Uh, there's world championships in it and everything. Like it's, it's just, it's the perfect board game in my opinion. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, don't talk to me about Monopoly though. I don't like Monopoly, and <laughs> I just don't like that game. Uh, Carcassonne is another great one. It's like where you basically build um, cities and there, you put place down tiles with different designs on them, and they cr- you can create like cities and features on the landscape. And when you complete them visually uh, with the tiles, you get points for them. It's another great one. Um, one great one I played very recently, uh, I bought it off a, a Kickstarter campaign, it's called uh, Crisis. So it's by two Greek board game developers who are inspired by the financial crash in Greece uh, about 12, 13 years ago, similar to Ireland, I guess. And um, they created this game, which is like a f- near future kind of dystopia. And you basically control the economy of a fictional country, uh, but everyone you sort of play against the board and also against each other. It's very interesting. It's quite a complex game. The rules are quite dense and it, it takes a, it takes a playthrough to understand how it works properly and to understand all the nuances of the game. But that's the kind of thing I love. Like, d- don't, don't talk to me about Cluedo or whatever. I mean, Cluedo's a great game, but don't talk to me about that kind of game that you can pick up in an afternoon. I don't want to know. I want the deep you know dense gameplay that takes takes a couple of playthroughs to fully understand and you know when you're playing with people who are really seasoned with board games that that's the kind of games i like uh what i'm just looking here at what i have it's also trivial pursuit which is a bit more simple but it can be very fun if you have the right crowd and you have a bunch of know-it-all nerds who know a little bit about everything (laughs) those are my kind of games um yeah i just i do like complex games like really deep kind of games um like just not the usual stuff you'd you'd find in the shelf on a in a in a in a toy shop or whatever you know the ones that you'd go to like a tabletop gaming place that also sells like warhammer figurines and stuff and they'll have like a, a shelf of of uh like really incredibly difficult board games that's the kind of stuff i like you know really obscure stuff um I just get bored easily, so <laughs> I need kind of uh, I need some some interesting mechanics, and I need some uh, thought put into the game, and and a game that's really made by someone who is into board games. Uh, I find they're always the best because they because they they always go like a step deeper and uh, just more satisfying. Um, and I think if you take the time to learn them, learn a complex board game, it becomes really fun then uh, because you start to you start to discover there's way more ways to win than just one like a lot of like more mainstream board games there's only one way to win there's one objective one path to victory that's it but i like games that give you different tools to win the game so there's more than like there's many different avenues you can go down to to get get a victory like Catan is a prime example um you know there's many different strategies to to w- actually win the game but yeah, yeah. So I have a question for you, Mike. In terms of computers, so on a computer, but not necessarily Linux or open source, what would be like your pastimes? I um, this is really weird. This is how I got into Linux. Uh, just installing things and trying things would have been the first thing, right? So it doesn't matter if it's Linux or before Linux. Uh, basically, uh, finding a piece of software that you can install see what it does, and then probably discard it because you kind of don't have the use for it. But, uh, like, it started... I think the first thing I did this with was uh, OpenOffice, in, which is a weird pastime. I know it doesn't make any sense, but I, 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 I opened... I, I uh, was working on a computer back in Prague in the early 2000s, and it was a Windows XP PC, I think. And it obviously had Word because I needed it for work, and I installed OpenOffice just to see what it does and how it compares to Word. Obviously, I couldn't use it because everything had to be done in Word, but just that. And then I've tried a few times installing Linux and then installing different software, and then I got into programming. So uh, try programming this and that, uh, using, you know, try different languages. Uh, That kind of stuck with me. I'm still, like, right now, uh, you know, we've had two episodes about you, and I'm still actually still looking into it, still trying to work with that that's that's one of my pastime but you know to most people this actually sounds like work 
which kind of is, right? Because I, if you open my computer, you will find like one or two games. I think you mentioned City Skyline in the in the chat. Mm-hmm. I had I I, I like that game uh, as well. Uh, it does run like dog shit on for me. I don't know why. <laughs> and it does run uh, on on Linux. It runs slow. On Windows, it just doesn't run for me. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Um, I, I enjoy, and it comes in bursts, like, so there might be three weeks for me when I completely binge, like, Anno 1800. I'm the and same. then I won't touch it for half a year. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's weird, like, especially if I, if I, like, last, like, once I got COVID, and I got COVID so bad that I had to take time of work, the first day I was out of it, I think, and then just the second and third day, all I did was, you know, I just picked up the computer and play Anno. And it always come to me these things when I've after a, let's say a big push at work, something happens, or I'm too tired, or I get ill, and then I reach a point when I'm like, yeah, you know what? I think it's time I just stop working and start playing some daft computer games. And Anno is not actually daft. Anno is a pretty good game. Uh, so is City Skyline. I like Red Alert Free as well. I would like to play. You know, I have um, like Bioshock uh, as well. You know that that that. Kind of also all of these games are pretty old, but I don't have top of the notch gaming hardware because I didn't want to. So there's that. So you would find weird things that are installed because I wanted to try them. You would find some games. Um, I am. I really want to get back into electronics. So I have um, Arduino, Raspberry Pis. I have a lot of like uh, components. You know capacitors, resistors, uh, jump leads, this, this, this kind of things. I have, I have several breadboards and, and, and a lot of buttons, switches and, and the like that I could play with. Uh, but it's just about the space. You know, the, the, mm. this kind of thing is not fun when you have to put it away at the end of the day. Yeah. So I would need some kind of a space where I can leave it out and come to it when, I have, when I'm in the mood and don't have to put it away. You know, so that means that I would have to basically, we would have to move for this. So next, maybe when, when we move into a bigger place. On that, actually, uh, just quickly on that. Uh, so what I'm showing you on the <laughs> webcam here is a breadboard with a lot of wires and electronic components in it. You know, there's resistors, LEDs, potentiometers, uh, audio jacks like um, like that you would have on a guitar. So what, what, this, what this was, was an attempt to create a, a guitar distortion pedal circuit um, on a breadboard. It did not work. <laughs> I plugged my guitar in, plugged the other end into the amp, uh, hooked a power source up to it, and all I got was no matter what I did. So I, I messed it up somewhere. But um, yeah, that that I, I agree with you. That's the kind of thing that you really need a dedicated workspace for. And I have had to just abandon that hobby because I, I do love, like I've mentioned before, I started playing guitar a couple of years ago um, just during COVID to keep me sane. And I found that, like, and I, I've talked about Bitwig and Ardor and lots of music software and things like that, and guitar pedals and whatnot. I've always found that I'm far more interested in the technology behind the music than the actual playing the music itself. So I get bogged down in, in all the extraneous things uh, to do with guitar and all the gear and all the plugins for DAWs and all the, all the extra stuff other than just making the actual music. Um, so yeah, I, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, because I, I, I had to weigh up my options and think, I said to myself, sure, I can have like a whole electronics little workstation here with all those little tiny drawers with resistors in them and stuff like that and have a whole wall of components. But I said, if I can't even do this one project, like, do I really want to commit myself to this and have all that stuff lying around? Uh, so, I, you know, sometimes I feel, I feel like with all these different hobbies, you have to pick your battles and think, right, I have finite time on this planet. Uh, I have finite resources, you know, mental resources as well. Um, so it's not always worth it. Sometimes I have to just let some hobbies go. <laughs> so I completely understand. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there are. I I don't for the you know benefit of humanity. I uh, I don't have any aspirations in music because that would be just terrible if I picked up an instrument. Uh, but I I don't know. My my things are kind of like so. So what I do, I obviously work. I play board games. Uh, I mess around with. I mess with the computer uh, because do, doing doing whatever there. 
and uh, I go running, but it's not a hobby, it's a must, because I want to be able to keep walking through the door without turning sideways. So <laughs> uh, I was told by a doctor that I have to I have to exercise, so I grudgingly do so, but I make it better by listening to podcasts and audiobooks, and I read, obviously, and I watch, watch shows on telly. Uh, well, telly, you know, it's a television set, but it's it's streaming. It's not uh, it's not terrestrial. Uh, you you obviously listen to podcasts. What do you listen to except for this here show? Oh, um, I'm. I, it's I don't know. Is it like bad podcast etiquette to mention other podcasts? I don't know. <laughs> is it? I really? don't know. I don't know. Well, I mean, I I don't think it we're is. We're not a for profit podcast. We're not making any money off this, so we're not like doing ourselves out of revenue or anything. But like. Yeah, like in terms of podcasts, yeah, I would listen to a lot. Um, I, I used, I went through a phase where I, I didn't actually listen to any podcasts at all, which was a bit crazy for someone who helps to make one. Um, but no, I've gone on a podcast explosion in the last year. Um, I listen to lots of stuff. I, li- I listen to a lot of like news podcasts and stuff like that. Um, I, what I love about podcasts, uh, I listen to one about the Ukraine war, which is sounds a bit of, of a downer. Um, it's called Battleground Ukraine. But what I like about podcasts like that is they give you way more insight into these issues than you would get on the news because the news is very soundbite kind of, you know, short, short headlines, short pieces of information. Not Nothing is too deep. Um, and, you know, you can read The Guardian all you like, but like they're never going to give you the full picture of anything so i love listening to um economics podcasts and news podcasts and things like that where they give you like a lot of deep information about about the news and stuff Uh, apart from that i really love darknet diaries i would recommend everyone listen to that show it's uh, a show about like cyber crime essentially some of the episodes can be quite hard to listen to because they delve into some very you know um very upsetting kind of topics you know you can imagine the internet and crime you 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 can you can think about where i'm going with that um and uh i listen to uh religiously listen to the blind boy podcast so the 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 irish listeners will likely know who blind boy boat club is um he was classed as kind of a novelty musical act about 10 or so years ago with a band called the rubber bandits um but now he's he's, for the last x number of years he's been doing i'd say seven or eight years now he's been doing a podcast by himself and his stage name is blind boy obviously his real name is just a normal name i don't know and and, uh, but he's uh he's actually a super insightful person talks about all sorts of things like art culture the history of really obscure things um goes on hot takes like deep dives into like mental health topics because he's actually qualified in that area um and uh just really fascinating kind of stuff he interviews all sorts of experts on on all sorts of different topics like he couldn't really say what that podcast is about it has no central topic really but just really interesting kind of thing and it's very funny as well um because he's just a very funny person um so yeah the blind boy podcast uh, essential listening um and then, of course, like, you know, the Linux stuff. He know, he knows, but, you know, all Joe Ressington's podcasts, <laughs> basically. Um, I can't really think of any others. That's kind of the gist of it, really. Then, obviously, YouTube. There's a lot of YouTube channels I would follow. But I'm trying to get away from YouTube. I don't know about you, but I follow a lot of channels on YouTube very religiously um, and will actually actually subscribe and hit the bell icon because there's just it's just a good way of filtering out all the noise on YouTube because there are so many channels that are not worth a damn and then there's like a small like core diamond core of like two dozen channels that are just really fantastic and just produce great stuff um I hate calling it content I'm sorry I really want that word to die I hate the word content it's just it just kind of depersonalizes it for me too much it's like oh we're just churning out stuff for you to be aware of like i don't know it's it's just not a good word you know a show a podcast a show that's the better word you know um a video even that's better so i do there are some really great again creators i'm falling down that rabbit hole again aren't i uh let's say publishers i think that's a better word so it's a more traditional word for this kind of thing. Uh, some great publishers out there, people who are making really good stuff. Um, 
that's why it kind of pains me that you know the internet's become so commercialized and commoditized and everything because there's some really great stuff if if you look and i think it's really democratizing you know the fact that we have youtube and podcasting and all this kind of stuff because it just enables like someone sitting in their bedroom with a good idea to just get their stuff out there and not have to go through some shitty corporate middleman i understand that the platforms they're using are shitty corporate middlemen but you know swings and roundabouts it's an interesting take i mean that's um obviously i i do agree with what you're saying that we need uh <laughs> creative disruption or not or not yeah create is it the creative this no creative destruction to use a schumpeterian term i think yeah that's the key difference yeah but it's it, to me, I'm kind of missing in all this noise, you know, I'm kind of just old enough to remember when you bought like a broadsheet and opened it and you kind of thought, okay, what's written here is probably, if not true, because I don't believe humans are capable of objective truth, uh, deeply philosophically not belief that we are capable of it. Uh, but if it's not, it, if it can't be objective too, it's at least someone's best effort analysis of what actually happened. You know, the same thing that you said that you miss in evening in the evening news. It's never been for me in the evening news. The, in the evening news on telly were always too short and too soundbitey, always too silly. But I I do miss that. And to the effect, I, and I think uh, I think newspapers themselves have gotten a bit too, like most of things, have gotten really a bit too either one-sided, like the, the Guardian that you mentioned. Yeah, that has got a lot of analysis, but it also makes you feel so miserable mm-hmm. because, you know, they pick up all the great courses, but it's just, there's no, there's no way out in it. It's just, at least last time I checked, I just haven't picked it up for years because uh, not even the paper or the app, because I'm just, I, I can't read this. It's too too annoying to you know uh i can't i can't actually fix the things that they are complaining about because you know uh, you can't fix the word and there is just nothing so what i'm doing instead is i'm listening to the basically you know the economist magazine that comes out once a week it's a pretty mainstream media and also mainstream economics a classically liberal magazine but what they do have is the means uh, to pay people who know what they are talking about. Now, you might not agree with their opinions and conclusions. I often don't. But at least they give you the full, or at least they try to give you the full picture and they spend time on it, which is important, right? So if they if they are talking about, I don't know, the war in Ukraine or uh, anything that kind of needs more needs more uh, analysis than just two lines in a paragraph uh, in a you know in a in a printed newspaper somewhere or in, 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 in on a website then they will provide it and it's an interesting thing because it's a read by professional uh, readers or actors voice actors so they take the newspaper or the, the magazine and read it from the beginning to the end hmm. And it's a really interesting experience. It's professionally uh, done. That's not to say that within, like, it's eight hours, eight to nine hours every week. So what happens sometimes is that you have one line repeated because somebody slightly messed up the editing. Guys, I, I'd imagine there are really tough deadlines and everything. But it is, it is great. It's, it's not free. It, you need to subscribe to The Economist to get that, obviously. And it's, it's the viewpoint of... Yeah, classically liberal newspaper and classically liberal in economic terms. That means they actually believe in capitalism as the as the thing that's as the best uh, mechanism for people to uh, to progress. Which I don't think it is, but that's what we have. So if someone's describing it to me, uh, that is helpful. You know, it's not. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Uh, if someone can at least s- stake out their their argument and you know give their viewpoint without it devolving into what we have now where it's a basic denial of reality you know on some parts um we have these extremes where one side is saying all of society has to behave a certain way and that's the end of it because we think so and then another side saying no everyone can act whatever way they want all the time and any you know and you can't tell me not to um so, you know, we have to have something somewhere in between, you know, <laughs> you 
you know, there, there has to be some sort of structure to society and there has to be some sort of structure to the economy. Um, and we do have to have certain rules in place um, for everyone to kind of get by and live a normal life. But, you know, don't 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 shove your shit down my throat. You know, um, that's the way I see it. And, you know, I, I hate I, I don't want that to devolve into like all opinions are valid because I don't believe that. I don't think that's true. <laughs> I, I genuinely don't. I mean, if, 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 if your opinions boil down to uh, I think this with no evidence and fuck you and that's your argument, then I'm sorry, you're just wrong. <laughs> if you're objectively wrong, you're just objectively wrong. But yeah, to get back to what you were saying, though, yeah, it is nice to have kind of a mainstream take on these things and, and, and a centrist kind of take on these things. Um, even it, like, and it doesn't necessarily have to be biased in any, you know, in any way, you know, um, there, there can be some great writing in these publications where they're not necessarily trying to push a certain view, but they're just kind of explaining why this thing is how it is, you know. Uh, there's a great, uh, uh, just to, we were talking about podcasts a while ago. One I'd recommend is by an Irish economist called David McWilliams. Uh, his podcast is really great because he doesn't necessarily take a, a position on anything, but he is just an economist. And he is like, you know, this is what I've studied. I understand the economy. I understand money. I understand our system. And this is me explaining it to you in simple terms, why this thing is the way it is. He's not necessarily saying, I think it's good or bad. And he will often say, he will say that on cer certain aspects of, of the topic, you know, he will, he will give his opinion, but not in, not in a way of like, this is like terrible, or this is really good, you know, he doesn't get too, uh, you know, emotional about it. And I do like that. I think there's a place for that kind of media where it's, it's just, look, this is my area of specialization. Let me explain how this works and why it is the way it is without kind of getting too passionate about it, you know? Uh, that has its place. Yeah, exactly. And I, I do believe in uh, uh, letting the experts have, the, ha have a say uh, more than, like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to give of it. Otherwise, other than that, like, um, I listen to... Well, except for uh, except for the economists, I listen obviously to Joe's podcast as well because I kind of find them. I used to listen to much more Linux media. Some of it went away because people stopped producing that particular show. Uh, some of it I um, kind of stopped making the time for because one thing I do now more than uh, than before. I, I've always used to listen to this audio books like since I don't know five years ago, but I now kind of prioritize audiobooks over podcasts because I realized that that the whole I mean at least it feels like the whole uh independent media scene including Linux is kind of taking more and more political opinions and uh, maybe I don't need to you know pay attention to that because you know, I don't want to get into the details because, you know, I don't want to criticize any shows that I, you know, I don't want to say, well, I used, I used to like this show before and now it's just, it's just annoying because, you know, there's reasons why people do things. And uh, if I don't like it, well, I don't have to listen to, listen to it. They don't owe me anything, right? So there's a, there's a few shows that I stopped listening to over the years and uh, I kind of replaced them with audiobooks. Um, and that's, that's another thing. Like I, I know this is the most horribly proprietary, I think, Amazon-owned thing is Audible. And uh, it's not cheap either. I'm, you know, uh, being a privileged Westerner, <laughs> I, I can afford nine euros a month. But uh, uh, yeah, I can see, I, I can easily see how people, why people would. And I think people should, uh, if they can't afford to use audiobooks, I would go as far as, as say, yeah, just uh, torrent it if you can. because. You know, even during COVID, even when when I didn't actually travel anywhere, even if you just go for a run or for a walk and you're by yourself, just the thing that I can put a book into my ears that uh, probably actually, uh, I would go as far to say as saved my life, not in the sense like it preserved my sanity, but because I used to read books whilst walking <laughs> i grew up in a I, I used to go to a school in a in a small town and grew up in a village when i was a teenager and i used to and it used to be okay for me to 
come home on the bus and walk from the bus stop uh, 15 minutes to my house whilst reading a book because there was one crossing in the middle. Then I moved to Prague uh, and preserved the habit of reading a book. And I once was reading a book, I walked into a crossroads and I heard a car swearing around me. <laughs> and at that point, I realized that I walked into a crossroad <laughs> with a red light on. Oh, no. Just, just not even understanding it, right? So I think audiobooks, at least for people like me, yeah, no matter if it's proprietary or if you have to pay for it, I don't care. It's This, this is literally a lifesaver because I find... Uh, I don't think I I don't like just walking to uh, to just 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 without the sound. You know the kind of thing where people say, "Well, you should just notice the environment around you." Yeah, the environment hasn't changed. It's a lovely environment, but I don't need full attention to it. Mm. I also don't want to when I run. I don't want to listen to music uh, because. I don't know, just something about it. I would eventually end up listening to, I would go faster with the music. It would just make me more exhausted. And that's probably not a good thing, right? I'm doing it to stay healthy, not to kill myself doing cardio. <laughs> um, so, and I need to make the run sufferable, right? So so that's what podcasts, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, the audiobooks do for me. I have to say, I, I listen to podcasts at two, twice the speed, though, because... Um, I, 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 and it always surprised me when I, for some reason, listen to, like, switch on a show with, at, at normal speed. <laughs> it is very disorientated. Yeah, I just can't do that because um, oftentimes, like, because I'm very selective with the things that I consume um, when it comes, and podcasts are no different. So when a podcast I like comes out, it will be an event for me. Be like, oh, great, you know, um, I'm going to go for a walk, listen to this podcast. I'm going to really enjoy every minute. And uh, if I listen to it at twice speed, it's going to be over twice as quick. So I don't, I want it, I want it to last as long as possible. I love a long podcast episode. I love long podcasts. Like, a lot, like there, there's a lot of people that do like shorter kind of ones, like the 30 to 45 minute mark tends to be the average. But I actually love it when I see a podcast episode that's like one, two hours long because that's my that's my me time you know i get to listen to that podcast for for over an hour and and uh, i can get really into it i tried the audiobooks thing honestly i couldn't get i couldn't get into it i had an audible subscription for a few months and i just just couldn't do it like i kept cuz i'm a very uh, distractible person so it's it's very hard like when i'm reading a story especially fiction i can't listen to fiction i just can't do it um if i'm listening to a podcast it's 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 always about like people places and things you know it's it's never really about a story uh, uh, of any description um so yeah i tried the whole audible thing just couldn't wrap my head around it just cancelled the subscription i even uh, i had uh, an e-reader i had uh, a kobo because i just point blank refused to interact with amazon apart from amazon prime that's the only thing i that's the only road i go down uh because they just have a few shows that i like and i I, I, yeah, I just have to have a physical book in my hand and I have to dedicate time to reading because otherwise I'm just going to lose the story in my head and I need to focus on it 100%. And I'm a huge science fiction nerd and I will hungrily consume any any kind of really intense deep sci-fi that I can get my hands on. Um, so that's another, that's a nice little segue, I, I guess. Uh, what are some of the books I like? Um... <laughs> My number one favorite author is Ian M. Banks. Um, absolutely love him. Uh, the Culture series is fantastic. Check that out. Um, I'm currently reading Alistair Reynolds' Revelation Space. My friend has been trying to get me to read for years, and I'm loving that as well. A little bit dry. The prose is quite... It suffers from that hard sci-fi tendency to just be very... The prose tends to be quite dry, and the characters tend to be quite one-sided and stuff. And it's just like... We, they, they stepped onto the space station and then it will describe every aspect of the technology on the space station and all the geopolitical circumstances that led up to that moment. But it will not actually tell you like what people are feeling or thinking, you know, <laughs> you know, like, and I, I do need character, character development. I need narrative. I need all that, all, the, all the, those aspects of the story. I just can't have someone recounting a future history that hasn't actually happened to me you know like it's too dry but th that book kind of skirts the line and it's it's quite good and uh i'm trying i'm just looking at my bookshelf to get oh yeah of course oh the expanse oh the expanse is just one of my favorites uh the books are fantastic the show is great you know 
show can be a bit janky at times. The the maybe the performances and the dialogue can be a bit wooden sometimes, but it's still a great show, still a fantastically uh, created show. Like the the attention to detail and like the design and the the art direction and everything is just just phenomenal. Um, I haven't seen anything like it in in a long time. Uh, we I know we talked about Star Trek. I was all, I've always been a lifelong Trekkie. Um, I've always been way more of a Star Trek guy than a Star Wars guy. Um, but we talked about Picard, and I've realized recently, I was like Star Trek is just kind of dead for me. It's it's had its time. It's it's been and gone. They can produce all the new shows they like. I'm probably just not going to watch them. It's just the Star Trek I like is in the past. That's the way it is. You know, I'm okay. I've made my peace with it. <laughs> um, that said, I did enjoy a few of the seasons of Discovery. You know, when you just switch off the kind of ranting fanboy in inside your head. You know, Discovery is its own little thing. It's fine. Uh, Picard, on the other hand, no. Just, <laughs> just no. Like when you when you take the Star Trek out of it, like it's it's actually just an objectively bad show. Like it, even just removing the Star Trek from the equation, it it's just a badly written, badly paced, full of plot holes, full of like narrativium or whatever they call it. You know, you know when they basically just say a word and that apparently just like fills a plot hole somehow it's like uh, it was one episode she said oh no it's banned by galactic treaty and it's like wait what hang on what what galactic treaty the tre- treaty with who like you have to explain these things a little bit more or else it just sound you're just saying words and that's how it differs from old star trek because in old star trek they would have like gone into more detail and explained these things and had a discussion about them in the show and everything science fiction is definitely my bag um i've always been into it I've dabbled in other things like Blender and stuff purely because I wanted all those sci-fi things in my head to become reality. And that's kind of the main reason I was interested in Blender because I just love films and filmmaking and I I just love that whole process. Uh, I just think it's fascinating that you can take this app on your computer and think of things. And if you know how to use the application, you can make the things in your head become real like visually, which is just kind of bananas to me, if you think about it. So I think all of the, where all this is going is what I'm trying to say is all my pursuits are pointed towards the central conclusion that computers are amazing and nobody seems to really think about that anymore. Nobody seems to think like there's so much potential in the technology that we use to, to do some like super incredible things and you're looking at videos of memes or something on tiktok that really don't mean anything like this uh, fucking (laughs) nihilistic shit that you see on tiktok and everything that really doesn't i i don't get it i don't get it but you know i just love to i just want to go around and shake people in this modern world and say there is more to this than you think you know like you can do some really amazing things with computers and uh, and not even just computers just technology in general i think this same was the feeling in the 15th century when uh, Gutenberg came up with, with the press. And I'm sure there was plenty of people for thinking, oh, finally, everybody can get the books because they are going to be cheap and everybody gets super enlightened and we will stop whatever shit we are doing that's really <laughs> harmful to society and we will all improve. And it actually happened. You know, information flowed freely, but there was also a, little, a lot of bullshit printed out and keeps going printed out, right? The same with photography. Uh, again, people were probably thinking, well, now when we can capture how people li- live, maybe everybody can share it out and we just improve the world because everybody can see what actually is happening. And yeah, it did help a little, but still, again, it's not, you know, society improves kind of incrementally. And I still believe that the internet is a good thing, that that the sharing of information and computers, yeah, you get a lot of... Um, I don't know, uh, racist trends about the latest Love Island uh, episode. <laughs> so really nasty comments about shit that doesn't matter at all. But like, do you get a lot of good things as well? So I showed you a book, right? So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always on two things. I'm reading a book and I'm listening to a different one because you can't really synchronize printed media with, uh, with audio books. That's just not a thing. So what I'm reading is, um, don't write to me about it. Don't talk to me about it, nobody, because I'm in uh, roughly two, one quarter of the book. 
and I don't want to hear about it until I finish it myself, right? And it's called uh, Fall or Dodge, uh, Dodge in Hell, and it's by Neil Stevenson, the same Neil Stevenson who wrote uh, Snow Crash, uh, who wrote Cryptonomicon, and so on, right? And this is exactly about the same problem. So he describes eventually a future, at least at the point of our book I am, it's, it's in the near future where everybody is hooked on what he calls streams. So you are a fairly well of liberal person, you have a stream editor who is condensing the mostly uh, automatically generated nonsense that uh, is floating around in the web, in the internet, who's condensing it to so that you can only get information that's both within like kind of comes or is in accord with your worldview but also is relevant to you right because most of the internet has become a uh, conspiracy theories and automatically generated to make people angry and so on right then because people are now obviously using glasses to or in the book are using glasses to to to, to see everything so everything is very personal so you have to protect yourself because most of the internet is actually harmful and so so people employ third party companies or uh, if you're rich really then you get one that you pay for one mm. who, uh, people who will edit it for you but there are people who obviously are not so uh, fortunate and they just get uh, they get like a biofeedback sensors biofeedback sensors connected to their uh, to their devices and so they get incoherent streams of just images and audio that make keeps making them angry mm. And they are hooked on that kind of thing. So it's like see where this is going. It, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I haven't finished it yet. So, so it's but it's a really amazing book. I mean, Neil Stevenson is one of my favorite authors. Obviously, Ian and Banks that you mentioned, great. Uh, I, I love those culture books. And uh, I have one more. Like since I'm started mentioning authors, I'm not as much into science fiction. Although I started out with a big Jules Verne kind of or Jules Verne as they call him in English, kid. It's not something, he was also quite anti-Semitic in his books, which is not something that you realize until you actually talk to Jewish people about it. Mm. Uh, because, uh, you know, at least no, now, now you probably would as an educated person or even an educated teenager, but when I was a kid, that information just didn't make it through, uh, you know. Uh, but anyway, but he had this, like you walked into the Nautilus and then the next three pages would be describing how the technology worked, you know, how yeah. you had how you get the ac accumulators and this and that and how uh, because back then you know everything for him it was electricity was the main force that is going to shape humanity um you, what do uh, you have to, oh twenty thousand leagues under the sea it's oh backwards nice on the webcam yes but uh i yeah my girlfriend bought me that um because i had read a couple of jules verne books when i or jules, jules verne uh when i was uh mm. when i was a kid and uh my girlfriend is french so i, I find myself in france a lot um and we actually went to his hometown and we went to the Jules Verne Museum, which was interesting. Uh, but there was also no English text on anything, which is something you find in France a lot. <laughs> uh, if it's a very t touristy kind of thing, you will find like English and French kind of uh, captions on the displays. But in this case, no, no English whatsoever, just French everywhere. Uh, so it was a bit lost on me, but uh, it was interesting to see that. But I didn't know about the whole anti-Semitic thing. Well, it it kind of he he's not he's not right you know he never wrote like kill all the Jews or anything that horrifying but there was a low like you know low grade nineteenth century phobias that permeated their entire literature right so he wasn't so uh, so, so so he was like you have um, one of the novels where a bit of earth is uh, splintered out and you have the I think if I remember correctly you have got like a bit of Gibraltar and a bit of Ceuta are basically floating in space. <laughs> and one of the characters is a trader who has got all the gold. And obviously, as he describes him, the guy has got a big nose and he's cheating everybody because he has got a... They, they want to use his scale as a scientific instrument and he's uh, he's he has it... It's it's rigged so that he can cheat people whilst he, on gold and stuff like that, you know? So, But he had a lot of um, what you call um, stereotypes. He had a lot of stereotypes, mm. you know? When, when he was writing his books, and France was right at this at that time against one or the other superpowers in the world back then, you know, so against Germany or against, the, so he would write a book where the negative character would, was from that place. So you're twenty thousand leagues under the sea. The the bad guys are basically the English or the worst mm. guys there. 
and he he was subtle though so he would not never you know he wouldn't write at least as far as i remember he would never say be overtly against it but uh, yeah and uh, by anyway it uh, it kept me um entertained i i think i read i don't think i can say i can read all of his prose because he wrote a ton of stuff but being czech i like one of the few advantages of not actually being brought up in an english speaking country is that I had these books properly translated, annotated, and with illustrations. I saw some of the translations of, of Jill, Jill Vine's book into English, and they were mm-hmm. atrocious. There was some lady in the 19th century who, who abridged it, she changed it so that it suits the English audience, and so on. Basically, just, you know, you might just as well not bother with that. And I think it's improving. I think somebody's making... Um, Good translations now. But, uh, yeah, it's. I, I had the whole thing. I had like it, it was a thing when I was a kid, and um, yeah, so that was one. And I kind of never got into the adult stage of literature. You know, like people my age would normally read. Uh, I don't know actually what they would read because I don't read it. <laughs> uh, uh, what I have on my audio book right now, I I'm reading The Last Graduate uh, by Naomi Novik. Which I think is like meant for like the oldest teenagers or something. It's a it's a take on the whole magical school thing, but not Hogwarts. <laughs> yeah, but imagine if if Hogwarts was like populated with real people and everything in it was trying to kill you. Right. <laughs> so the premise is, is that um, there are wizards. Wizards are hunted. Wizards have uh, mana, which is that's how you know that's how they differ from the rest of us, and that's how can they do they can do magic. But that's also why they are hunted by maleficaria, which is you know things that eat the mana out of them. So sounds very familiar. And yeah, and this is this is uh, and the school is there's no teachers or anything, just kids, and the school teaches them on its own. And they every day they have to spend. Uh, fighting for their lives because the the maleficaria is trying to kill them. Uh, the school exists because it's still better for them to be inside than outside, but it's still deadly, right? So that's the premises. I'm not going to go into the details because I'm uh, all halfway through book two, mm. and I don't want to spoil it for anybody. But if you are into, and it's written from a point of view of one of the students, and but just the way it's written, it's a cut above most other things. Mm in my audiobooks collection i have i have more than a hundred and it's just the language of it it's not it's not probably i don't know i don't know how to judge language but this one really captivates me you know sometimes you read especially this kind of urban fantasy or whatever the genre is called you can you can read and the date or listen to it and the dialogues are sometimes not not all that natural it comes up you know, or people when they are describing emotions, it's sometimes a bit too on the nose. But this uh, this author, she kind of hits it right into the sweet spot between explanation and subtlety. Mm. You know, she she is a genuinely good writer, at least as far as I can tell. Maybe some people write that write to us that I'm I must be crazy that she can't write for for shit or something. Uh-huh. You know, I don't know how to judge these things. I'm not a critic, but I really enjoy uh, listening to these audiobooks. And lastly, this is an indie thing. Sorry, I, this is, is going to take to this is going to have to become a Mike's and Shakes book review. But like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what I really enjoyed, and I'm going get, to get back to in, and this is, I promise, this is the last one. Although I could just scroll through it and just co- keep commenting because I love books. Um, obviously, Terry Pratchett, we, we, I, I haven't mentioned, but that just doesn't need mentioning because that's Terry Pratchett and he's amazing. He was amazing, but there is a collection of free books called The Perfect Run by Maxime J. Duran, I think. I'm, I can't speak French, so I'm probably mispronouncing it, but uh, and it, obviously I have it translated. Or Actually, it was written by a French person in English, though. I don't think it's translated. Uh, his name is Void Herald, and he's... Um, He's something with in the I think like in the D and D universe. But this is different. This is post apocalyptic Europe, and everybody has some kind of. Oh, lots of people have some kind of superpower. The main protagonist has got. Um, he can do. He can turn back time. Few minutes of I don't know. A few minutes anyway. And uh, but just the way it's written, it's amazing. Like it is so funny. Uh, I am going to, obviously, links to everything are going to be in the show notes, um, and I'll just stop talking. Yeah, these are going to be some hefty show notes, because we mentioned quite a lot of things. 
Um, yes. So it, it started off basically, what are our nerdy pursuits outside of Linux? And it devolved into us just saying all the things we like and why we like them. <laughs> all the books and, and TV that we like and YouTube channels. Yeah, so, well, you know, uh, do you have any non nerdy pursuits? Uh, do you support any sports ball team? <laughs> I, I'm going to go, yeah, c- take a complete detour here. The episode's getting quite long, but whatever. Um, oh, yeah. It doesn't matter, whatever, we, we, can, we can self-indulge this week. <laughs> I'm going to go completely away from, from culture and everything. One of my favorite things to do is gardening. Yeah, I said it. I love gardening. Um, like, I just love, uh, like, my stress reliever, um, my way to just, like, decompress and, and de-stress and forget about the, the, the pressures of life is to go to a nice park or a forest or some sort of uh, nature preserve or whatever and and just walk amongst trees and chirping birds and hear gravel crunching under my feet. I just think that's like the absolute number one stress reliever. And it's been proven as well. There's studies that show that actually being in nature and away from, you know, uh, urban environments is very good for your mental health. Because for obvious reasons, I guess. I mean, we're animals, like we're animals that can think and make memes so like we you know obviously being in a more natural environment is going to be better for your mind i mean i think it is pretty obvious and yeah that's just my thing i just love plants and and the natural world and obviously i'm I'm a big i'm a big guy for sustainability and how we're completely fucking up the planet and really angers me so uh yeah that that's that's something i love doing like out in the garden i love planting things and i'll like research all the plants and make sure that they're native and they're not going to take over and um and upset the upset the ecosystem and everything and when i see bees in the garden i get really excited and (laughs) things like that um and i'm quite privileged because i live quite close to uh dublin uh so i only live like maybe a 20 30 minute walk from the city center of dublin and uh we're just quite lucky in that we have a home here that's that's close enough to the city, but that we have a small garden uh, and uh, so, and uh, some nice parks nearby. Um, so yeah, that's that's something I really love doing. Um, and it's just nice to get away from kind of a screen and a keyboard and just like get your hands dirty, get dirt under your fingernails, just pull some weeds out of the ground, dig some soil, you know, mulch mulch some crap up and put it in a big pile for compost. You know, um, get really excited when you see that, like, there's a there's a few. We have a raspberry bush in our back garden, and we get like fresh raspberries every year that we can put in desserts or just eat them straight up and just like gobble some fruit that we grew ourselves. We also have gooseberry bush, and I don't know if anyone has tried gooseberries, but they are so delicious. I and they're so it's so easy to grow all these things. Just go out, just go get some like autumn fruit bushes or something. You can probably get them in Lidl or whatever or Tesco. Uh, you can get them in the little gardening section and you just plant them in the ground and throw some compost in a hole, plant them, water them. Well, it's Ireland. They water themselves, basically. <laughs> and you really don't have to do anything with them. They'll just take off and grow. And like a year later, you'll have a bunch of bushes that have lo- lots of really tasty fruit. And it's just really nice. And then you can plant different things and you can throw some wild fl- flower seeds down and not cut your grass too often. And then you just look out your window and you have a lovely little meadow. And you've got lovely flowers and bushes and birds and insects and all that kind of good stuff. And it just gives you a nice good feeling in your, down in your belly. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just a nice distraction from the techno-capitalist society dystopia that we have at the moment. So that's that's my uh, that's my advertisement for gardening. I would say if you're feeling uh, even if you live in an apartment or something somewhere you can't have like a little plot of land to plant plants, I would say just get like some window boxes, anything, just pots, window boxes. If you have a balcony, a windowsill, just do it, just do it, <laughs> just plant some flowers, plant some plants. You can get some basil seeds, you can get some thyme, rosemary. Stick the seeds in a pot, leave them near a window. Um, they're probably going to grow just fine if you leave them, leave them near a window and keep them watered. Um, and they're probably going to grow even better because they're not outside where all the bugs can eat them. So you'll just have like really f- lovely fresh herbs just sitting there ready to go in the kitchen if you want to cook. I'm a shit cook, so don't take it from me. But my girlfriend's a very good cook. And uh, yeah, I've been trying to get her little 
basil plantation going for a while now it's hard to get it going but when you do oh my god and the smell is unbelievable so yeah that's my recommendation for all the the techie guys out there get away from the computer once in a while go dig some dirt plant some trees do whatever it's 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 good stuff uh coffee is another hobby of mine i wouldn't say it's a hobby but i do really like coffee and i have uh, I have like the cafetiere, the thing you push the plunger down and everything. And I will go to the shops and I'll actually look for nice coffee, go to markets and stuff. And it sounds really hipster, but it's not <laughs> before you say it. Um, <laughs> it's just a nice thing to wake up to in the morning. You know, you you pull out the coffee, you spend like 10 minutes making it and then you get the smell. It's just, uh, it's just lovely. It's just a great way to start the day. We we don't go very hipster about that, but we have we buy whole beans and uh, we recently got a, uh, a grinder, and we obviously have used the Spanish cafetera, which is uh, the Americans call it mocha press. I think somebody said it uh, like you know. Uh, is that the one you put on the hob? Yeah. So you have you have a tank of water at the bottom, uh, then that 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 creates steam that goes through the actual and, coffee. Yeah. That's and great. condense at the top tank. So yeah, that's mm-hmm. uh, it, yeah. it's it's called also an Italian coffee maker. Um, but yeah, it's very strong when you use it. Use that. Yeah, I mean it. It does have to fuel you for the rest of the day. So. <laughs> See, my trick is I just make it sort of. I don't make it too strong, and I just drink lots of it. Yeah, I, I don't actually like the taste of coffee that much. I drink a ton of it because I have to in order to stay upright. I could probably get rid of that kind of habit, but you know, it's nice to have something to kick you, uh, uh, kick you into uh, into gear every morning. Unfortunately, I'm both. So I I, I adore the smell and the taste of coffee and the process of making it. But I'm also hopelessly addicted to caffeine as well. So <laughs> I have the worst of both worlds. So uh, I spend money on the expensive coffee and I also uh, am horrif- horrifically addicted to it. So uh, like I'm the kind of person if I don't have a coffee for, for 24 hours, I'll start to get headaches and withdrawal symptoms. You know, I think we could carry on doing this because we have not yet talked about I'm, I'm, I actually think you support the Irish rugby team, right? So you can talk about sports. I, I, I don't have anything in the area. This is the thing, actually. I'll briefly say that uh, I used to be really into sports, um, honestly. Um, never into football that much. I was into rugby, and I used to love watching uh, golf as well. Um, I used to play a little bit of golf. Um, it's just it's just fun. Anyone who's like, oh, golf is boring, just shut up. Try Just play it, get good at it, and then come back to me. Just, just, just for the <laughs> listeners outside of Ireland, which might not be obvious, to my surprise, I found when I came to this country that golf is a working class pursuit in here. I don't. I think that Ireland is unique in that matter. It's, it's everywhere else is super posh. Like, yeah, it surprised me to find out that everyone thinks it's. Yeah, that's really surprising to me because like going to like a, a par three, like where it's a par three is like a mini golf course. It's not mini golf. That's something the children do. But like it's called pitch and putt. So you go, it's a, go, a proper golf course, 18 hole golf course, but it will have just much shorter holes and they'll all be par three. And all you need to play the entire game is uh, maybe one iron, a wedge and a putter. And that's all you really need. So you can get by on like a seven iron, a wedge and, and a putter. And it's just great. You go, you spend three or four hours doing that and you come home, you just feel so refreshed because you've had a nice little walk interspersed with some bouts of violence when you're hitting the ball. And it's just very satisfying when you hit a golf ball in just the right way. It's actually, yeah, it's just, I really enjoy it. I haven't done it in years now. That's what I want to say now. Like I haven't engaged in any sports really for, for years now. Like I just kind of fell off that kind of thing. Um, I'll watch watch it when the Ireland rugby team play on, on telly, but other than that, I just don't really follow any of that anymore. Yeah, I uh, obviously had to, because when I was a kid, there were two or three channels on the telly, eventually four, and sometimes there just wouldn't be anything else uh, but football, because soccer, and by football I mean soccer. Where I'm from, soccer and ice hockey, massive. Like yeah. you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't go around without seeing somebody wearing a jersey for Sparta Prague or Slavia or or even like you know all the other regulars like Barcelona or uh, 
Bayern Munich or whatever, right? Or maybe not Bayern Munich. But anyway, digressing. Uh, we and I used to play ping pong. It was a thing in my city, specific or my, in the town where I went to school to. Specifically, it had um, you know all the sports, all the all the ice hockey and all the all the uh, football. But also, a lot of us were into table tennis, and a lot of us were, and a lot of other people, not me, because I can't play this thing. It was into volleyball, and uh, yeah, I I never got really good at table tennis because there's always been a lot of better people. I'm not very gifted in sports, but I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, it was like you you know you when when you were quite small, you would stay after school. Uh, bef- so that you make up the time between your lessons finishing and your parents uh, being home from school. So you sp- spend two, three hours in uh, in like a facility for for pe- for kids that are not in lessons, right? And there was a and we were all playing. Like imagine ten kids around a single uh, ping pong table, and what you 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 play what I don't know. It's a, I don't know the English name for it. Run around, maybe like you basically you hit the ball and run counterclockwise. Okay, and whenever you are and basically, uh, you start with ten kids, <laughs> and you keep running around the around the table. You hit the ball. You run. The guy behind you hits the ball. The one behind him. Then eventually, it's your turn because you're on the other side of the table. You hit it. Every now and then, somebody misses, loses, gets out, and so you narrow it down from the ten or whatever you start with to uh, to two. They don't run. Obviously, when you have two, you can't run around. And one of them is a winner. Uh, and we could play this for hours. It was amazing. Like. Wow. Okay. That's a, it's a never heard that way of playing table tennis in my life. That's interesting. Uh. Yeah. That that that's how you get around constrained resources <laughs> <laughs> because we only had space for one table t- table tennis table. Oh, okay. Wow. So we've managed to talk for over an hour about anything but Linux. So uh, I think there's like uh, another podcast idea in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Linux lads off topic or something. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that's that, that is perilously close to the new show that I haven't heard yet. The uh, what is it called? When you can ask the host? Is it called Ask the Host? Anyway, when you can ask the host of the like uh, Linux After Dark and uh, Linux uh, and so on, mm. you can ask them anything except for Linux. But I f- yeah, it's it's an interesting idea. You know, everybody has got life outside of uh, the, the the operating system. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think we'll. Uh, my cat is currently annoying me to feed her, so um, I'm going. I think we are going to uh, wrap this one up. Um, we've managed. We've managed to talk incessantly, even though there's only two of us this time, and uh, we've managed to uh, clock up well over an hour of 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 recording here. So thanks very much for listening to this and for indulging this little detour we took while the other lads were away. If you have anything you want to let us know about, uh, just email us on show us show at linuxlads.com. Um, if there's anything you'd like to hear us talk about in future, you can go to linuxlads.com forward slash contact to see all of the links. Yep. So thanks for a good chat, Mike. It was just us two this week, but I think we held down the fort nicely and we'll be back in approximately two weeks with with the other two lads. Yeah, it was a it was a great chat. Thanks. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, bye bye. <laughs> yeah, bye, I guess. <laughs>when this gets published uh there's this, this is not gonna be there it's just gonna be jake's voiceover saying at this point shane went on another 45 minutes ran about star trek picard <laughs> and underneath it is gonna be like when you sped up cassette tape <laughs> just of you talking